Hello, everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace here. I hope that uh, you guys have gotten your day off to a good start. Uh, I want to stop in and talk to you real briefly about the biology of beliefs or the biology of faith. Uh, and before I do it, I want to remind everyone to look into uh, the post description section or if you're on YouTube, the description section. Uh, and there are a couple of promos in there. One thing that I'm offering until tomorrow, which is Friday the 28th at 6 p.m., is 50% off all one-on-one -on -one, uh, direct engagement programs, whether it's coaching, whether it's counseling, um, whether it's therapeutic. Uh, that extends until tomorrow, uh, for, uh, what is it, September 28th, 2018. Uh, the way it works is you go and you pay for the program, uh, you screenshot your purchase confirmation. You email that to the uh, email address that's listed along with the promo code that's also listed. And it will be immediately refunded. 50% of the purchase will be immediately refunded. Uh, so uh, all in one day, you'll be paying 50% uh, uh, for all of the packages. That's all the way up to the platinum package. Uh, will be 50% off until tomorrow at 6 p.m. This is a great chance to really get in on uh, some direct engagement, some serious uh, focus on doing some things that will help you change your life at a multiple, uh, from multiple angles at multiple levels, levels in multiple aspects. Uh, also, uh, if you haven't gotten a copy of uh, book number 20, uh, book number 21 and 22 are already on deck. I'll tell you guys more about those uh, in the coming uh, days. Also, I will be re-releasing two previously uh, in print editions of some work I did. My first book, uh, The Invisible Father, Reversing the Curse of a Fatherless Generation, is going to be released this year. Well, it's uh, a revised version is going to be released and it will be re-entered into print. It always stays in digital form, so you can always purchase it in digital form, but I'm really re-releasing it in print with a revised version. Also, my fourth book, When Your House Is Not a Home, Dealing with Conflict in the Marriage, that one will be released again, uh, a revised edition this year as well. Uh, I will get dates to you in the coming week. Uh, so keep your eyes open for that. I'm excited about that as well. Those books, despite not being in print, are still uh, two of my top sellers. Uh, and so I'm excited about that. All right, let's talk about the biology of belief. Uh, you know, we tend to have abstract ideas about how things that work. And one of the things that we have mystified with great consistency is the idea of faith, what we believe in, how we hold things together in our beliefs. And our beliefs, what we have to understand, first and foremost, set the expectations that we have for our lives based on our beliefs of how things work around us, the paradigms we have that determine how we see the world, how the world, how we believe the world impacts us, how we believe we have the capacity to impact the world or the lack thereof sets the expectations of life. If you believe that being born in poverty uh, resigns you to a life of poverty and that poverty is your lot in life, then you will have an expectation of living a life of poverty and you will never rise above living it. God always meets you at the level of your expectation. So if you have an expectation of uh, struggling in the area of relationships because of something you experienced as a child or something you experienced in uh, relationships early in life that gave you an idea that you would never ever be able to foster healthy, strong and positive and influential relationships, then you will never be able to gauge it. And matter of fact, when the opportunity to have something that you, 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 you are sure you won't have presents itself, you'll sabotage the opportunity. Uh, I know people who have sabotaged relationships year after year after year after year. I know people who have sabotaged business opportunities. I know people who have sab sabotaged uh, all types of opportunities in the area of impact and relationship because in their mind, they believe that they can't have it. And until you get to a point to where your expectations dictate something that it is that, that, that you deeply desire to have, 
you will never have it because God only meets you at the level of your expectation. Uh, you can call it what you want to. God, the universe, life will only meet you at the level of your expectation. So first and foremost, our beliefs set our expectations, how we view the world. And what we have to understand is that the first seven years of our life is what sets the vast majority of our paradigms. We uh, are from the age of birth to seven, five to seven years old, are constantly downloading information through observation, uh, what we sometimes call hypnosis, in a state where we're just simply looking around us and observing the world. And if we come up in a family where there's abuse, uh, we tend to think that that's common, we normalize it, and we expect it. That's why young girls who had abusive fathers who abused their mothers or even abused them tend to end up with abusive guys if they don't correct the paradigm. That's why creating paradigm shifts is so important if you have erroneous thinking. First of all, I can tell you that everything that you're seeing in your life right now as a reality is the result of your thoughts. Your thoughts are the seeds of your destiny. And what, when you look in, 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 at where you're at right now, you can trace that back to a thought. See, a thought is the beginning of creation. And you are creating the life you're living through your thinking processes. Now, we've been trained to find every reason why everything in our life isn't going that way except to look within. But everything you manifest in your life, you have control over. The problem is we live in a culture that loves to point the finger and point the blame. Don't get me wrong. In no way am I suggesting that the person who hurt you didn't hurt you and that it was your fault. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that as you think and process information, you have the ability to determine that you have control over what's happening in one way or another. And I mean, even as, let's say, a 12-year-old kid who doesn't have the physic physical capacity to stop anyone who is an adult from harming her, she does have the wherewithal and whatever level she's been empowered by those in her family, by her parents specifically, but also by people in authoritative positions. If she's been empowered, if anybody ever does something to you, you go tell so-and-so-and-so, -and -so, then she's not helpless because she has the ability to go tell. The thing comes when she tells the wrong person and the wrong person helps to cover it up. That's a different situation, but what we're talking about is there's no time in your life that you're sitting there and you don't have options. But we live in a world that tells you you don't. Why? Because if I believe I don't have options, it's easier to accept the thing that doesn't require anything of me than it is to say, I can change this, but it's going to call for sacrifice. I can change this, but it's going to call for commitment. I can change this, but it's going to call for risk. See, we, 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 we seek comfort more than we seek elevation. We seek comfort more than we seek empowerment. We seek comfort more than we seek power. And because of that, we're always looking for a place and a way to point the finger and find something to blame. And the problem with that is you cannot maintain your personal sovereignty and point fingers at someone else. Because when you point a finger and you blame someone else for your situation, you also give them the power over the situation. It's only by saying that while that person hurt me, I let them, but I let them in. Do you say, okay, that in that I have some power. I have some leeway and some latter, uh, I have some latitude in which I can see how I can control that. If they're hurting me, I can cut them loose. But if all I can see is they came in, they took over my life and they hurt me. Well, you may be able to blame them and it may help you in some kind of way escape the, the, the accountability and responsibility and culpability, but it takes away your power to rise above it. But then, so you've got all these things, but it, what we don't realize is that even in this hard wiring we get, because what happens is in the first seven, five to seven years, you are downloading all of this information through observation, through what you see, what you hear. Everything is telling you what you should do, what you don't do, uh, what's not a good idea based on what you see. And you get this idea of what life is. It's hardwired. It's the lens through which you're going to view life called a paradigm. And until you reach a point in which you are willing to change your paradigm, it's going to govern about 95 to 96% of your behavior, your outcomes in life what you end up with and everything is gonna be determined by what's hardwired in your mind at the age of seven. So these are the beliefs. Now these beliefs are gonna set the, I mean, these beliefs are gonna set the expectations. 
See, somebody told you that you couldn't do this because you weren't good at this, and it's now hardwired in your mind. So anytime the opportunity to do this particular thing presents itself because the belief is hardwired that you can't, you never have the expectation that opens the gate for you to do it. Now, that's the mental element of it. Here's the thing. Beliefs or faith or however you want to look at it doesn't just exist in an immaterial uh, realm. It also manifests itself in your body. See, there is something inside of you that was given to you uh, when you were conceived. Uh, you know, depending on your particular faith system, when you were conceived, created, or however you look at it, there's a design within you, there's a uniqueness in you, and there's an internal yearning inside of you that was real vivid at one point in your life. But see, a lot of people go through all types of experiences early in life from childhood to uh, adolescence to young adulthood, there are all these experiences. And if you are in a bad environment, a toxic environment, these experiences will strip away, hide and suppress that natural yearning that was inside of you from the beginning. It, 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 you will be so focused on simply surviving that the idea of thriving is no longer even on your radar. You're not even attempting to thrive. But here's the thing. It's not just mental in the sense of an immaterial reality or an idea. It's that every idea has energy. Every idea has the ability to impact your body because your thoughts also carry energy. And the energy is either positive or negative. And it, and it, and it regulates on a spectrum of negative low frequency that's i mean when you get to the lowest frequencies you're talking about anger worry stress depression all of these things are the result of your thoughts your cognitions things that are functioning most of the time below the level of consciousness but are still very real now the danger of it is because it's functioning in other words uh let's let, let, let me let me explain how that happens Every day, you process a roughly around 70,000 thoughts in a given day. Maybe somewhere around 2,000 of those thoughts are conscious. So the other 68,000 are in the subconscious, but nevertheless, they're being processed and subconscious governs about 96% to 98% of your behavior. So the things that are working below the level of consciousness have power and they're creating energy. That's why you can go from a moment where everything is cool and all of a sudden you end up in a moment of uh, melancholy and, and what, what, what you might call sadness. I won't call it depression because it may not last that long, but it can end up being a depressed state if you don't know how to gain control of what you're thinking. And if you don't know how to create beliefs that support joy. And, and when I speak of joy, I'm speaking of it in, in, in a specific manner. I'm not speaking about this uh, ambiguous idea of joy. When I think about joy in, in the way that I'm trying to describe it, I'm thinking about a state in which no matter what happens, there's a level of happiness. There's a level of elation because you understand the bigger picture. In other words, joy is this thing that says this moment doesn't define me, good or bad that my totality of my existence and the greater picture of why I'm here and what I will accomplish in my life transcends this moment. And for that, I'm grateful. And that's the joy of it, is that I may be down now, but I'm not out. See, you've got to be able to think with, from the bigger picture or when you hit a snag in the road, when you get into a moment, you will start to perpetuate the negative because you're so focused on it. So many people get caught on where they are now that they can't see where they're going. And if you don't learn how to see where you're going, you will never have the energy or the fuel or the passion to push through the moment. But let's talk about the biology of it all. See, when you have beliefs that don't provide you with an expectation of elevation, 
And when I say elevation, I mean elevating out of bad relationships, elevating out of financial difficulty, elevating out of uh, a, a, a poor situation in your job, elevating out of all these things that have you in a negative mind state, a negative energy frequency and vibration. If you don't have an expectation, what happens is you have this negative vibration, low energy that will perpetuate the idea that you're stuck. And the more you accept it, the more powerful it becomes. But what is happening is because you can't see beyond the moment, the moment becomes perpetuated. You live it in a cycle over and over again. It repeats itself and you get frustrated. But the energy that is constantly being emitted is negative. And in that you get stress hormones released into the body, especially cortisol, also adrenaline. And in short bursts, in small increments, in, in specific situations, it's a lifesaver. But when it's constantly being released into the system, it's poison. It's toxin. And the thing is, when you talk, start talking about chronic stress, you're talking about the constant existence of cortisol in the bloodstream. And this stress hormone is designed to pull and force the body to pull away blood supply and oxygen from main arteries, I mean, from main uh, organs like your heart, your, your lungs, your liver, your, and more importantly, your brain, your prefrontal cortex, and to rush it to areas that facilitate survival. You know, you got to fight, you got to run, so your, your extremities, you know. And so now you're not in the clearest state of thinking ever because you're in a chronic state of stress, a chronic, chronic state of worry. So what will make you reason and rational is not activated, your prefrontal cortex, your executive part of your brain, the CEO of your brain, the prefrontal cortex, isn't operating properly because it's being shut down. The more you stress, the more the prefrontal cortex shuts down. The more you get in survival more, the more the, more the prefrontal cortex shuts down. Now, uh, other people may be able to look at you and see your behavior and say, that's not rational, that's not reasonable. But because you're not functioning from a place of reason anymore, it's perfectly normal to you. So now you are combative with anybody that's trying to help you because where you're standing, everything's good. I'm doing what I gotta do. Uh, uh, this person's trying to do this to me. This person's trying to do that to me. Everybody's the enemy. And you don't understand you're creating it with your expectations and your expectations and your beliefs have biology, meaning that you are going to be physically impacted by what you are mentally thinking. And the only way to change that is to change your thought processes. One of, one, uh, for, for those of you who are practicing Christians, um, I want you to, 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 to take a little trip with me. Those of you who are not practicing Christians or have never been engaged in Christianity and the scripture is going to be totally alien, Follow the principles, because the principles apply across boards, cultures, religions, and everything. I want you to catch the principle of this. Um, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning at verse 3, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Then it starts to give instruction. It says, it's casting down argument and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity, into the obedience of Christ. Now, Let's break that down in principle. So the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. See, a lot of the things we think we need to win are based on what the world has told us we've got to have. So we'll give up on a vision because it doesn't have the money or the finances to, 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 to support it or facilitate it. We look at a situation and say, I'm outmanned and I'm outdone because we buy into the idea that we're fighting our life based on what we can see. But the very weapons of our warfare are not in what we can see physically, but what we possess internally and what we believe is possible because you can get something done by simply creating it and calling it as though it already exists, starting to behave as it is, and your mind starts to buy into it and your behavior changes. See, the behavior is the, the result of what the mind believes and how the mind functions. If you want to change your behavior, you, re, you rewire your brain to put, produce the behavior. Now, well, the thing is, when you rewire the brain, I'm telling you that the brain does not have the capacity 
to determine what is being imagined and what is actually happening. God designed that on purpose. Why? Because every time you need to do something, you're not going to be in the condition, situation, and environment to get it done. But if you can sit up and create in your mind the vision and then get into, I mean, literally climb into the vision and start to experience it from your place, the place of your imagination. Now, we, 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 we can see all of this happening in the Bible. It says you call things that are not as though they were. Why? Because once I call it as though it were and I start to believe it, the mind doesn't know that it's not really happening while I'm imagining it. The mind says, this is who I am now. So the mind starts to produce the behavior of who you believe you are and who you're imagining you are instead of what you are right now. That's how you change. See, if I get caught up in the sadness of the moment and I over-identify with the sadness of the moment, when I over-identify with poverty, when I over-identify with failed relationships, when I over-identify with struggles in academia, when I over-identify with not feeling beautiful or not feeling handsome or whatever it is that, that gives you a sense of self and a higher self-esteem, when I over-identify, it locks me into the reality that I identify with. I can never graduate from it until I'm able to see myself outside of it. You've got to see it before you can become it. And you can't have it until you become it. You, you don't get what you want, you get what you become. And if you can only see yourself as, as you are now, you can't come out of it. So many people are overly identified with what they used to be and what they are now that they can never see themselves being anything other than that. And then they wonder why they produce it because your brain will carry you where you say you are. So some way, somehow, you gotta see yourself outside of that. And, 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 and again, here, here's one for the Christians. See, I love the example of Gideon because this is the creator engaging the creation, which is also a creator. But check this out. God comes upon Gideon. Gideon's in the wine press thrashing wheat. You don't thrash wheat in the wine press. You press wine in the wine press. But Gideon is hiding from the Midianites because Gideon is a coward. Gideon is afraid. And the Midianites are wreaking havoc. And so here comes God. And God says, man of valor. And Gideon said, who are you talking to? Gideon said, don't you see me in this wine press, fresh and wheat? I ain't no man of valor. And God again calls him a man of valor. So what you saw was God has a way of seeing you as he created you and not in the way that you have existed or what you have been, but what you are becoming. And that's how you have to look at yourself. See. You may not be fulfilling the capacity of your potential, but you've got to see yourself in that magnitude in order to produce it. Most people are so assigned to their current condition that they never even consider their capacity for better. And when you do that, you set a, 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 a box. You hear people talking about thinking outside of the box. All thinking outside of the box is there are these hardwired beliefs that say this is how things are done. And if you don't have this, you can't do that. And if you want to do this, you have to do it that way. And all of these things set up this box or this parameter that we operate in life in. And when you start talking about thinking outside of the box, it's saying that just because this is the way it's always been done doesn't mean this is how I have to do it. I have a capacity to create based on being in the image of my creator, one thing that I have is the capacity to call things that are not as though they were to walk into it, crawl into it, exist in it in a manner that I can experience it before I hold it. Now, this, this applies <coughs> regardless to what <coughs> faith you hold or practice. But you've got to be able to see it before you can have it. You got to be able to revel in it, celebrate in it before you have it. You know, uh, you know, a lot of church people understand they used to say dance in advance. So you got to be able to see something before it happens. You got to be able to 
witnessing and experiencing inside of your mind. Again, the brain can't determine what is being imagined and what is real. The people who have been the greatest inventors, the people who have had the greatest success are the people who have the greatest imagination. Why? Because they are not locked into someone else's reality. They know how to escape what we call reality and live somewhere else long enough to create something that doesn't already exist. It also allows you to topple down the tower of impossibility. I'll use Roger Bannister as an example. Up until 1954, it was believed that no human could run the mile under four minutes. That was this four minute barrier that simply existed. And not only did people believe that you couldn't run it, there was a large group of people who were under the idea that if somehow you were able to run a, 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 a sub four minute mile, you wouldn't live to celebrate it because you would die because your heart would explode. Now, let me just uh, have a real slight digression with that for a second. Imagine there's this barrier where immortality of some sort is on the other side. And I mean that in legacy, that something you can do is going to totally change the world and it will be marked down in history and never forgotten. You know, so in, in that sense, it immortalizes the, the, the accomplishment. It immortalizes the purpose. We're still talking about Roger Bannister, I mean, 70 years later. Post. Now, we get, we get to, okay, Everybody believes, well, most people believe that if you even do run the mile in under four minutes, your heart is going to explode. Let me ask you a question. With that mindset, how many people do you think were on pace to break that record before Roger Bannister and then thought about the pace they were on and that if they stayed on that pace, their heart was going to explode and back off? Now, how many people are out there doing things but expect that if I do this, something bad's going to happen and never take the risk? Immortality is on the other side of that effort, but you don't take the risk because people have told you that you're going to suffer something you're not willing to suffer. But here comes Roger Bannister who says, I'm willing to bet my life that it's possible and that I'll live. Because ultimately the belief was you're going to die. So you're not just training to do something they say is impossible. Even if you succeed, it's going to kill you. But Roger Bannister said, I'm going to put my life on the line to prove that I can do it. Now, when you talk to Roger Bannister, which is why, why I brought him up in the first place, and they ask him, how did he train for that? How did he do that? How did, he, how did this happen? Roger Bannister says, before I ever trained one day to break the four-minute barrier, I ran that race under four minutes in my mind a thousand times. You know what he did? He trained his brain to do it. The body was always ready, but the brain was the inhibitor. So he trained his brain that it was not only possible, but he told his brain he had already did it. Now, here's the thing. When you run that race in your mind a thousand times, the brain doesn't know that you're not really running it. The brain thinks you're running the race. So the brain logs it. Now, guess what happens? Now that the brain has figured that it's ran the mile in under four minutes 1,000 times, what is the brain not afraid of anymore? Dying after running it. So there's no anxiety, there's no worry, there's no stress. I'm out and I'm running now the same way I ran it in my mind. My body is responding to my brain and my brain is dictating that today is the day. What are you thinking that's holding you back? What are you believing that's holding you back? What beliefs are affecting your biology in a way that's literally tearing you down and killing you? Another example of the power of the mind, and then I'm gonna shut it down. Another example of the power of the mind. They took uh, 50 basketball players, 25 they put in the gym with, uh, these all 50 were poor free throw shooters. They put 25 in a camp with two or three of the top free throw shooters of all time in the NBA. Uh, and uh, they worked on technique, they worked on form, they worked on repetition, and they shot and they shot. They spent hours upon hours doing this study in the gym. That's all they did. They took another 25 
and wouldn't even let them touch the touch a basketball during this time frame. And they made them practice shooting the free throws perfectly every time in their mind. They never touched the ball. It wasn't physical repetition. You know, you got muscle memory, which trains you in mechanism and follow through and everything else. So it becomes automatic when you get ready to play basketball or catch a football or anything that deals with your motor skills and mechanics and biomechanics, it's, it, it becomes inherent in your responses. You just know when a ball comes at you, how to catch it based on how it's coming at you. But they don't get to do that. And I'll explain that in a second. But what they are told to do is for hours a day, you're just going to sit up and in your mind, you're going to see yourself shooting this free throw perfectly. After the study was over, the group that never practiced outperformed the group that did by 35%. That's statistically significant. So the ones that are practicing, so then why are the ones, if you told practice is made perfect, why are the ones who are practicing not performing as well as the one who didn't? Because practicing it in your mind is more powerful than practicing it with your body. Why? Your body can never produce perfection, but your mind can. You're not going to hit every free throw when you practice it. I don't care how good you are. You're going to miss. And when you miss, your mind can register to miss too. And so you never, but when you see yourself hitting every free throw, confidence level rises. So the anxiety, the worry, and the nervousness that you have at the line is gone. Plus, it's the ability to see it happen. So now the brain knows the perfect flow, the perfect shot. So it's dictating mechanisms and mechanics to the body as you shoot the free throw physically. If I want to, if I'm working with a, 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 an athlete and I want to change a technique in anything, I change it in their mind first. I don't change it on the track if I'm working with a track athlete. I don't change it on the field if I'm working with uh, a, a football athlete, I don't change it on the court. If I'm working, I change it in their mind. I let them see it, how it looks. I let them see it. And when they get out and they do it for the first time, there will be a difference in their original mechanics and their new mechanics before I ever start to physically work on it. And yes, I do physically, uh, not very much now, but I do physically train. Matter of fact, that's the first thing I ever did as a business owner was fitness uh, and sports specific training. But anyway, then I moved on to other things. But anyway, what I'm trying to get you to understand is there is a biology to your beliefs that interfere with your state. See, when you're in the highest state of gratitude, there's a different energy level. When you're in the state of high expectations, there's a different uh, energy level. There's a different biology. There's a different biochemistry that is taking place in the body that will dictate how you feel. How you feel is going to be re re uh communicate it to the brain and then tells the brain whether it's good or bad. And then you're going to have this ongoing communication between the body and the brain. Well, the brain is communicating, and th this is the more in-depth uh, version of psychosomatics, where the brain impacts the body. And we know for a fact that it exists. We've studied it for years. But what we need to understand is the depths at which it happens. When someone says, I'm worried sick, there's truth in that, scientific truth. When they say this job is killing me, <laughs> that's scientific proof. If you're waking up and going to a job that you hate, it is. You know, I mean, some people have started businesses just for the sake of the fact that the business will produce money and they could get it done, but they're not operating in a purpose. They're not getting fulfillment. And that business that they own is killing them. You've got to find purpose above all else and serve it, or you will find yourself diminishing in areas and, and, and maybe not being able to explain it or understand it. So what am I getting at? There's absolutely nothing happening in your life that you have no control over. You don't control other people, but you control how you respond to them. You control how you deal with them, how you connect with them. You, you control the amount of time and access they have to you. So if people are toxic, you don't need to, you don't need to give them access. If you've got a bunch of negative minded people who do nothing but drain you of energy spiritually, emotionally, and psychologically, you don't need to be giving them access. But we've been conditioned that certain people that hold certain titles, brother, sister, mama, daddy, automatically deserve access. The only ones that deserve access are 
your spouse until they do something so destructive that you revoke that access, but you can't say, I want to marry you, and then say, you can't have access. But you can say, I gave you access and you screwed it up and I'm revoking it. But your children deserve access until they reach adult maturity because you created them. You created that responsibility. You don't get to walk away from that one. And they're going to challenge you because neither one of them are going to be everything you think they should be in the way they should be because they're not you. So you got to learn how to deal with each one of them individually. But those are the only ones that have absolute access that deserves it. Everybody else has to earn it. Once you become an adult and you start making your own choices, mom has to earn her time by the way she deals with you, by the respect she gives. Dad has to earn his time. And we don't live in a culture that says that. We give toxic parents automatic access until they suck the very life out of us. One of the hardest things I've had to do was to learn how much time to give to people who were toxic. Because, see, the people who have the greatest capacity to, to be toxic in your life are the people you love the most. People you don't like, you don't even accept their invitation to go to lunch. You got, if you're at work and you got somebody that you know is toxic, maybe, hey, you want to grab lunch? No, I'm good. I got this to do. I got that to do. But the people that we classify as friends and family, they say, let's do something. You feel an obligation. You really don't want to do it, but you don't want to say no. You don't want to hurt their feelings. But they're sucking the life out of you. You need to surround yourself with people who will foster the beliefs that are necessary for you to achieve the things in life that you believe are important to you. And I do mean important to you because success to uh, me will not be success to you. Stop trying to live by someone else's standards of what you need to do in your life. Your success is based on how you interpret your purpose and your potential, how you're going to get the fulfillment out of what you were given in the way of gifting and talent by the creator. So you've got to determine in yourself what's successful, what's worthy of your energy, your efforts, your time, your blood, your sweat, your tears. That's your responsibility. Too many of us will be giving our blood and our sweat and our tears to people who don't value us. And we can't understand why we don't have energy. We can't understand why we're constantly fighting depression. We can't understand why. Because the biology of our beliefs are being impacted by people who are toxic to our purpose. Look, it's up to you to set the standard at which you're going to live life. The higher you set the standard, the better the results. But here's the thing. The higher you set the standards, the lower your tolerance for excuses will become. The higher you raise the bar, the less you're going to be willing to accept excuses from yourself and from others. And the more you raise the bar, the higher you perform, the greater the passion, the greater the purpose, the more central the focus, the more alone you will become. The very nature of your elevation alienates those who are not elevating. You got to understand, see, you can call them haters, you can call them what you want to, but as you begin to elevate, anybody that is not elevating or is not elevating at the rate that you're elevating, is gonna have a problem with you. And if you give them front and center stage and access to you, they're gonna to start to sabotage your growth. You're going to have to find who you are and know and value who you are in this world and the ability you have to bring about change and impact in this world enough to know when you need to cut people loose. With that being said, I'm going to jump off of here. I got a lot more to do, but you've got to understand how this works. It's so much more and it's hard. It's actually impossible to share this in a sitting. So actually, uh, one of my next books is going to be dealing with the brain and uh, the spirit and the body and how all of these things connect. It's going to be the next step after critical mass. And uh, I've already started on that. But what, what, what and I, I want to lay it out so that you can sit down and you can go through this book and you can understand literally why you do what you do. 
why do you get the results you get? I mean, it's literally, you can predict success and failure. I can sit down with someone and in two sessions of exchange of no more than an hour per session, predict whether they're gonna be successful or whether they're going to fail at their current state. I can predict their patterns of growth, if there is a pattern of growth or their pattern of stagnancy. And I can tell you, if you keep going the way you're going, you're going to be okay. Or if you keep going the way you're going, you're not. Success and failure is highly predictable. It's not a shot in the dark. It's not, it may happen, it won't happen. It's look at the patterns of your behavior and you'll see it. Look at the patterns of your thinking and you'll see it. You should be evolving. Even if you are in the right mindset, even if you've experienced success, you should be evolving. You should never be at a place where you're comfortable. You should never be at a place where you become complacent. You should always be evolving. And if you're evolving, you're advancing. If you're advancing, you're growing, you're elevating, and you're in a state of uh, expanding influence. And that's what you should be doing no matter what your gift is, no matter what your talent is, no matter where, where you're operating, you should be expanding your influence. You're here to make a difference. It's so much bigger than you. That's it. Look, I absolutely love all the people that will eventually see this video. Again, don't forget uh, from now until tomorrow at 6 p.m., the dates and all that stuff is in the description box. Look. Uh, you're going to get a 50% 50, uh, 50 rebate on any one-on-one -on -one session, whether it's therapeutic, whether it's uh, a performance uh, type uh, program, whether it's coaching, whether it's uh, literally uh, counseling for anything. And I also do, you know, marriage counseling, things of that nature, uh, my wife and I. But whatever it is, if it's listed on my site, uh, you can have it at 50% off. Uh, go to www.rickwallacephd.link and go to the Life Change Courses and Programs tab, hover over it, let it drop down, and everything under there will be 50% 50, 50 off. All you have to do is pay, send a proof of purchase via email. All the information is there. And uh, the same day, you're going to get a 50% 50, 50, 50, uh, refund. Look, uh, don't forget to get the book Critical Mass as well. Uh, book number 20. Uh, get it i mean there's so much in there that can help you so much in there that can open your eyes but what i can tell you is it's up to you everything you decide to do everything you want to do is going to be up to you with that being said i'm gonna jump off here i got a lot to do uh and hopefully i'll get back to you today because that's some other things i want to share um if time permits whatever you do live life on full so that you down eat that's my goal in life every day is to wake up and live it on full so that i go to bed on e and that I don't leave this life with stuff still on the shelf, undone, untouched. I challenge you to do the same thing. With that, I'm out.